Inside the News with Kel Richards. Great to have your company tonight. Now, let's turn to the subject of language. How could I not talk about language? Now, the English language is, as I've said so often, a river, not a lake. It is forever flowing into new channels, bubbling away, rippling, changing all the time. And those changes, that's what so many of us find fascinating, so interesting. And at the end of each year, our attention is drawn towards those changes and those new expressions in the English language when the major dictionaries publish their word of the year. Now, the idea for the word of the year didn't come from dictionaries. It was invented by the American Dialect Society. This is a professional association of wordies, American linguists, lexicographers, philologists, and they gather for their annual conference every January in a different American city each year. In a few weeks from now, they'll meet for their 2023 conference in Denver in Colorado. Starting in 1990, they decided that, seeing they had all these wordies gathered together in the one big conference room, it would be a good idea to vote for an annual word of the year. Uh, and they'll do it again this year when they meet in Denver. Well, then, the word of the year idea caught on as such a good idea, all the big dictionaries got into the act. But there's more to it than that, because these words chosen to represent the year tell us something about us, about ourselves, about the debates and discussions that have dominated the public square this year. So, joining us to talk about the word of the year, our choices is Executive Director of the Menzies Research Institute, the multilingual Nick Cater. So, Nick, Thank welcome you. to the program. Yeah. Let's begin with the Collins, because they were first out of the box when it came to announcing word of the year, and they picked perma crisis. Yes. Now, until they picked it, I hadn't even heard of it. What on earth do they mean by permacrisis? Well, permacrisis is what the media and some politicians like. They like this continual state of urgency. But to me, it's a contradiction in terms, because a crisis is a state of impermanence that leads to some decisive change. So now they're telling us we're in a permanent state of impermanence that leads to a change so decisive that it's going to change again down the track. So in I other don't words, know. It's, it's not a permanent state, it's an impermanent permanent state where nothing is permanent. Exactly. If you follow that, that's it. <laughs> right, OK. Well, that, that, that tells us what people are worried about, doesn't it? Mm. The, you also, I'm limited to English when we do language, but you tell us what the Spanish word of the year is, apocalypsis. Yes. Now, that comes from a Greek word which has come to mean over the years, didn't originally mean this, but it's come to mean a disaster. Yeah. It wipes out yeah. people and the planet and everything. Looks, looks a bit like a permacrisis, doesn't it? It does. Well, I think there are a lot of words of the year that, that reflect this degree of catastrophe, this, this sort of idea that we're in this permanent catastrophic state and the Spanish word apocalypse which is, means apocalypse or, or similar to it says that so is the French, the French France Inter, the French TV station uh, picked the word ecocide. It's saying much the same exactly, thing. Exactly. Uh, yes, environmental that, su suicide, yes. The world is about to end apparently because and, of and, mankind's care. And you're saying the fact that these words became so prominent tells us that there are community leaders, politicians, who find it useful to keep us anxious. Well, they do, don't they? I mean, every, every, uh, every dictator begins by creating a sense of crisis, doesn't right. it? You know, there's yes. always, it always is the way in. It's your sort of rite of passage if you want to become an autocrat. I mean, to be too dramatic, Hitler did... Uh, come after the Weimar Republic, which was a disaster, and he kept emphasising that it was a disaster. Mm. Anyway, we, we, won't, we won't stress no. that. No. no. Let, no. Let's go to dictionary.com. They chose woman as yeah. their word of the year, which is appropriate because both the Cambridge Dictionary and the Merriam-Webster added to their definition. They kept their first one, you know, a, a female member of the human race, but they added a second one saying, or anyone who identifies as a woman. Now, when, when that's happening, what is that telling us? Well, I, 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 I just don't see that you can make up a completely new definition for the word woman, different to any definition we've ever had since the English language was created, indeed any language. Uh, but I think Dictionary.com, they chose it because there's been a 14,000% increase in the number of people... People searching for the word woman. Searching yeah, for the yeah. name. It strikes me that a lot of confused people out there because it's not a word that I feel necessary to look up, really. Well, yes, we, th we thought we weren't uncertain about it. And when the Cambridge and the Merriam-Webster come up with this, well, anyone who identifies as a woman, it's introduced in my readers on my website, I think a recognised medical condition called the screaming heebie-jeebies. Yes. It really, really is upsetting people, isn't it? Yes, and I'd say a definition of woke is somebody who's unable to give a definition of word woman in four words or less. Oh, OK. Well, or four no. words or fewer, I should say, to be Thank you that. very much. Yes, otherwise we'd all get letters about that. Now, the Cambridge chose, uh, the Cambridge Dictionary chose Homer, 
is mm. their word of the year for the interesting reason that a, a, a home run in baseball, an American term, just because they had a massive spike when that word was used on a wordle competition. Yes. Uh, so that, that's how these things can happen. But their runner-up was shrinkflation. And you find that interesting, don't you? Shrinkflation, I think uh, we're all... We're all used to this. If, if we're consumers of confectionery, it, it's when a company shrinks the size of a product that keeps the price the same. Yes. Shrinkflation. And there's a related word, skimpflation, which is where they make the quality of the product worse. Uh, cheaper ingredients to keep the price. In fact, the same. I wonder if the inflation, the official inflation figure, disguises that. I mean, if you're running a little coffee shop, if you make every serving a bit smaller, mm. but still charge the same amount, you're coping with what's happening to your costs in a way that doesn't show up in the official inflation figures. But is this kind of skimpflation, shrinkflation, isn't it? Most people would think it was cheating, and uh, let's hope it never happens to a bottle of wine. <laughs> oh, then you'd really worry, wouldn't yes. you? OK, the big one, the Oxford came out with goblin mode, which mm. is the idea of living a kind of dishevelled life, living living all, all day, every day, in your pyjamas with, um, you know, cocoa spilt down the front of your pyjamas or so, and only bothering to put on a shirt and tie and have a shave if you've got to do a Zoom meeting. Now, mm. that's goblin mode. Mm. What does it mean for you? It suggests that we, we haven't really got over COVID, or some people haven't. They're still in that mode where they're switching off from society, sitting at home, as you say, looking dishevelled, uh, and just put a shirt and tie on for... Um, you know, for a Zoom conference. Yes, yep, OK. Look, let's go to the German word of the year because you can do these French and Italian and German <laughs> words, which I can't do. Uh, tell me what the German word of the year was. The word is Dunkelflauter, which, which means... Which is a lovely word to start with. We should all learn Dunkelflauter, shouldn't Dunkelflauter, we? Dunkelflauter, or the pr plural is Dunkelflauten. But it means... A Dunkelflauter is, is, means dark doldrums and it's used in Germany to describe when the wind isn't blowing and the sun is not much sun around, i.e. Right. you've got a wind drought and it causes big problems with uh, windmills. And we get Dunkelflauts here, of course. But uh, I was very impressed with one of my readers who sent in a message to say that she thought that uh, she, she, Dunkelflauter had entered the English language and that she knew somebody at her workplace who'd been called Dunkelflauter. Because they were... Lacking in energy. Lacking in energy. <laughs> Can I just say, the thing I like about this is I'd, I'd really linguistically like to get rid of renewable energy mm. and switch to the expression weather-dependent energy. Yeah. Because that's what it really is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, or, a bit, it's a bit dishonest to call it anything other than weather-dependent. Or, or intermittent, yeah. Yes. I think renewable is, is a little badge they put on it to make it sound nice. But uh... We've got to talk about teal. Mm. Uh, it was chosen both by the Australian National Dictionary Centre and by the Macquarie Dictionary as their word of the year. And it's, it's a distinctively Australian use of the colour. So that's a big word for us this year. I like, I like the colour teal. I, don't know, I had a nice teal coloured tie and I went out to a function and people said, what are you wearing teal for? Suddenly it's become very political. I think we should take it back. You know, like the word gay. Why should we have the word gay, which is a, a great word, appropriated for one specific meaning? Let's do the same with teal. Let's take it back. On my website, one of my readers pointed out that teals, plural, is an anagram of Tesla, both accessible only to the rich. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and another one suggested, I quite like this one, another one suggested it should be pronounced tills because it will make the tills ring for the people who are in the renewable energy business, and there are big companies in the business making a lot of money, aren't there? Mm. It's, uh, teal is a, is a way of getting around and saying that they're, they're not a party. Yes. And we know they're not a party, Kel, because they all believe the same thing. And, of course, that never happens in any political And, of course, their advertising all looks the same all yes. the time. Yeah. Uh, and they all chose the same promotional colour. So, of course, they're not a party and they can't be a party. Yes, let's be very clear, they are not a party. When you look at those words overall, are they telling us something about where our society is going, what, where, where our anxieties are, what it is we're either worried about or people want us to be worried about. Mm. It, th they do, but I always think it's interesting to look back at the words of the year for, say, five years ago. Some yes. of them stick, some of them don't. I mean, selfie, I remember, was a word of the year. That was coined up. in Australia. A lot of people do not remember that selfie was a word coined in Australia. This is our word. We gave the world selfie. We may end up regretting it, but we did. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But, but it, it's always... It's touch and go whether these words ever endure or not. And I think the test for word of the year is that it should enter the English language permanently, not just be running around on social media for a couple of weeks. And so, sometimes they try to pick things which are too trendy, which it seems to me they have not done this time. Mm. They've actually... Uh, 
by and large, they've managed to find words which really have been part of the national conversation and really do matter. Yeah. So we need to understand why they matter. And reflect social trends. I mean, the other one was quiet quitting. Yes. Now, quiet where... quitting is an interesting one. Explain what that means. Quiet quitting is where you, you do your job, but only just exactly what you have to do contractually. You don't do any more, you don't do any extra. Uh, I'd I prefer the old Australian word for that, bludging, which yes, of course was yes. coined in the 1880s to mean a man who lived off the immoral earnings of a woman, uh, but just means generally anybody who's a bit lazy. But I, I, quiet quitting, quitting apparently is a heroic act. People boast of quiet quitting on social media in order to show that they're correcting the work-life balance and they're not working too hard for the corporation. And people forget that bludger, as you said, was originally a pimp mm. and the original word was bludgeoner. He right? hit her clients with a bludgeon, uh, either because they were misbehaving or because he wanted to steal their money, and bludgeoner became our bludger. And, by the way, we, we tend to forget uh, that we, we send words to America. We don't just borrow their language. We, we, they borrow ours. And they borrowed bludger. It's in the 15th edition of the uh, Webster Collegiate, and they define it in the American way as goofing off. Goofing off. That's quite nice. We've given another word to the world. It's amazing how many words we give to the world, isn't it? We should be proud of our linguistic skills. Nick Cater, many thanks indeed. Thanks, Kel.